Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Glendraw whiskey tasting uh, with Alan Glenn. Uh, some of you may have met Alan before online when we've done our Highland Park tasting. Alan's uh, a brand ambassador for a couple of whiskey brands in Scotland and Ireland. Uh, and he's going to talk us through the range of whiskies this evening. Um, so, Alan, over to you. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, how are we all doing? As Mike said, my name's Alan Glynn. Um, I'm brand ambassador, as Mike said, for Highland Park, for uh, Glen's a lot as well, and a few other whiskey brands, as, such as McAllen, Glen Rottis, uh, Wild Turkey out of America as well. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about Glen's a lot. We're going to take you on a little journey through the whiskies that we have here. Um, don't be afraid to get involved. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of people in here tonight, so if we can try to keep the questions to the chat, sometimes it can be a lot better, but don't be afraid to jump across. If you do have any questions, um, I welcome them. Um, sometimes when you do these type of tastings, you'll always find people kind of saying that, uh, you know, they get introduced almost as some sort of experts and stuff like that. I in no means ever will call myself an expert on anything. There might be some of you in this call that might even know more than I. So if you have even, if somebody's asking a question and you have an input in it, don't be afraid to jump it across as well. I, these, every day to me is a school day as well. You know, we've all probably done a few of these things. We've heard different things. So I'm always happy to to let anybody get involved and let anybody talk. Um, the way we're going to work it through tonight is we're going to start with the putching, then we're going to move on to the double barrel, the triple barrel. We'll take a little break there because we do have a good bit to get through. We'll go on to the 17-year-old Mizanara cask, the pot still, and then finally the 25-year-old, if you're all still sitting or standing. I think I've done a few of these things. I made sure I got my setup nice and good to keep me up upright as we go through this. Um, so then, what we'll do is we'll start off with the putching. Um, open it up, knock it into your glasses. Now, as we'll give you, with, along with the putching, I'll give you a little story on the Glendalot distillery itself, but just a couple of different things here now. So we've got a 55% ABV putching here. So a lot of people, they'd be inclined to kind of taste spirits like they taste wines. They want to really get their nose in there. They really want to smell it. We need to be very careful as well here. This is 55%. We have a good bit to get through tonight. And if you stick your nose in that glass and you start sniffing in big and deep, you're going to burn your nostrils and that alcohol is really going to start stripping away. So all you want to do is give it a little swirl and just pass it by your nose as you're going and it'll give you that aroma. Don't just be very wary of sticking your nose straight in and taking that big whiff like you'd see people doing wine tastings. You really don't want to burn off your nose and burn off your nostrils. So here we have the Glendale Putching. This is the mountain strength, which comes at that 55% ABV. It's a really interesting kind of product. Um, Michael, I believe you said you had a history to do with this with Glendalot and their putting from previous tastings. Yeah, go back about, it's probably eight years now, I think. Um, we, had, we had a bar on Dorset Street called WJ Cavanaugh's. And every Wednesday evening, we had a series of events called Little Talks. And um, we had one that involved uh, Donald, a uh, brand ambassador for uh, Glendale, who's now based in the States. And he was there, uh, Oliver Hughes, uh, Lee Oliver Hughes from Dingle, the steward was there. And there was actually someone else on that panel. And I actually can't remember who it was. And the reason is because Donald and uh, Oliver Hughes pretty much just talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and keep talking. So much so that the event started at sort of seven o'clock. Eventually it wrapped up about nine o'clock. Uh, everybody, a lot of people left. Uh, uh, Donald stayed on and sat at the bar and talked for another two hours to the bar staff about poaching. And then everyone was out, we were clearing the pub out and you wanted it cleaned up. And Donald still sitting at the bar and still talking about poaching. I talked and talked and talked. Uh, in fact, he talked that much that uh, some eagle eye theft thief uh, spotted that his car had been sitting there for hours and uh, they had seen him come and go and take bottles out of it. So eventually when we did get Donald out of the pub about midnight, uh, we went to his car and someone broke in and nicked all the poaching out of him. <laughs> so Donald had to come back in while we waited on the guards. So he talked and talked and talked about <laughs> poaching. <laughs> so we had a good, uh, a good six hour lesson on poaching from, uh, from Donald. Um, that was, it was great. And, uh, but I've never met a man, there's probably two people in the, the whole of Ireland or whole of the world that are so passionate about poaching and Donald's one of them and uh, Dave Mulligan and Bar 1661, the, the two of them are just, they're so passionate about what they do uh, in, in poaching, going back 
years, you know, like I, I say, that goes back about eight years and we don't know. And I remember actually, I spent a lot of time traveling to London when I was watching the soccer matches and it had been one of Dave Mulligan's bars in London and it was packed full of poaching. It was they're the two people that just when it comes to poaching, they, they do it such a great service, you know, uh, and it is, it's a slightly, I would say, underrated product and th these guys have really sort of driven it you know there's a few other players in the market as well now but these guys have really sort of driven this is a, a really good you know it's a, a good it's a great beverage that, you know it's it's not just raw new make spirit it's there's a lot more to it than that you know 100 percent um no and i i remember donald myself about eight years ago it was my first introduction to the glendoff distillery when they launched this product now, a couple of questions coming in there. Tina and Kirsten asking, what is this Malter pot still? So to give you a story on the Glendale Putin. So as we know, a lot, of, a lot of people in Ireland set out, distilleries set out really to be Irish whiskey distilleries, and they really wanted to do something quite special and something quite different. But when they started to make their um, whiskey, they obviously had to stick it in barrel, minimum three years, average for five in Ireland before they could actually start um, selling whiskey. This was kind of before we've seen this big, massive kind of gin eruption in Ireland. And the guys from Glendalough said they wanted to go really traditional. They wanted to bring back something to Ireland, which was putting. And this is why they made this particular product. This, I see, uh, I think it was Brian there was saying it's quite sweet. He's getting rum and raisin kind of chocolate. Really good nose on the sweetness. It's a distillate of sugar beets and malted barley. So those sugar beets are really going to give you that raw kind of sweetness, kind of like that rummy kind of note you're calling out, Brian, like that sweetness there as well. Um, dark chocolate and hay coming in there for Dermot Vanessa, even another great call. Obviously, that hay kind of note is coming from that malted barley as well. So it's a really kind of combination kind of uh, blend on it. It is uh, pot distilled um, up to 90% uh, ABV. It's pot distilled. How often is it distilled? Not as often as it used to be. It's it's a kind of a, a tick away for Glendala. It, it slowly kind of burns away. So the distillations don't happen too often because the, the, the want and need for it isn't really there. Putching is... A fantastic kind of product that we can look at from Ireland and um, in that it's so original to us it is our it's our national spirit putting in 20 in 2008 got classification as Ireland's as a geog geographical, geog geographical classification within Europe as Ireland's national spirit uh, we've seen an amazing product come out from the guys on off the cuff called Aquavitae which is kind of the precursor to whiskey this is almost like a precursor to precursor um the word putting to a lot of people kind of install instills this kind of fear this kind of oh my god this it's illegal almost uh i've seen somebody put in the chat about putting in a drop of water if you want to put in a drop of water far away this isn't that kind of fire water that we're talking about that you get in the back of Connemara. but the word even putting has a great kind of origination and it's really where <clears throat> our irish language kind of was i don't know what you call it bastardized um, as we would have got um before it was coming from the Irish word pot. So this was all obviously distilled in older times in a pot. And it would have referred to as the potting, as in the small pot. So where you would have had the uh, Irish speakers kind of saying potting, but they would have been putting it like in Connemara, like myself, I lived in Connemara, I'm a Goy man, lived in Connemara for many years. And the pronunciations there, even I can't understand them at the best of times. But at the time they would have been saying pot or the small pot, the potting, they would have been saying the potting. And that's where the word actually comes from. So the Irish pronunciation would be potting. You hear some people say potting, you hear some people say putting, <clears throat> but potting would be the actual kind of pronunciation of it. But it's an each to their own kind of thing because when Ireland became anglicized, the English would come in and they'd start pronouncing the words we were saying with a different kind of tongue. So putting came out of potting. <clears throat> so that's where the actual origination of this comes from. And there's some amazing stories when you look at the history of Ireland and the history of putting. <laughs> Some great comments coming in there on the strength. So 55% ABV is quite strong. And it is really like such an original kind of spirit because it is, like I said it's our national spirit. It's a distillation from sugar beet. So technically being a distillation from sugar product is probably the closest thing you can get to being an Irish rum to start off with. But then bringing in that malted barley is kind of bringing you onto the whiskey kind of trend as well. And it's a very hard way to kind of categorize it because technically if you're looking at it, it's a, it's a neutral grain spirit. So you can really categorize it against vodka as well. But that's why we got that classification for it to be putting, that it's its own classification. And it does light on a spoon, Luke. <laughs> it lights up on a spoon when you set fire to it. There you go. And that 55% really is going to be quite strong with you. Uh, as I was saying, there's some amazing stories when it comes to putting, like being from Connemara. 
one of the biggest suppliers of putin in ireland actually used to come from the aran islands and when they were actually bringing it in from the aran islands they'd always bring it on a sunday morning and the reason they'd bring it on a sunday morning was they knew all the gardi in connemara would be at mass on a sunday morning so they'd get the boat in off the island and they'd start delivering all the putsy in around connemara on a sunday morning and they'd be hiding it just outside people's houses out the back of their houses in their sheds because they knew the guards would never catch them on a sunday morning while they were at mass <laughs> this is how they used to get around things Maybe I was onto something at the start there, Alan, when I said it's like mass. Yeah. <laughs> I had thought about that when you said it there as well, Dara. I was like, well, you're, you're going to get a bit of mass into you now in a second. Um, but it's, it's a fantastic spirit. Raw, it really does have those kind of rum notes. Uh, to me, it also kind of has almost like if you ever tried like a really raw kind of style tequila, it's coming from a sweet base from agave to sugar beet to sugar cane to molasses, everything in that rum tequila kind of region. It has that raw kind of sugar kind of base to it but definitely is something quite special. Fantastic for our country as well to have this product and to be within ourselves and to be that classification for ourselves. It's, it's a the guys bit, launched. I really like it. It's a really, nice, a really nice drop. It's, it, it's sort of, I'm, I'm not going to say it's unaged whiskey, but it, it, it sort of, it has this flavoursomeness that but without that sort of oak or vanillin that you, you would get in a whiskey. Yeah. But it doesn't taste, what I'm trying to say, I suppose it doesn't taste like raw. You know, like you know, like when you taste like whiskey off a still, it can be quite sort of grainy and rough and ready. You know, this this isn't rough and ready. It's it's a quite a I hate using the word, but it's quite a smooth, sort of drinkable product, is you know. Yeah. Oh, it is. And I personally I love it. And even like, and I'm not gonna lie, it's been a couple of years since I've had it myself, and even I'm re, re reintroducing myself to it, and it's amazing to try it again. Uh, when they brought it out, the guys from Glenlock did so many interesting things with it as well. There was a lower level, there was a 40% ABV. Uh, I have one of the original bottles here for anybody. It's actually a sherry finished putching as well that they did. Let me up to the camera. It's a sherry finish that they did in their putting as well. Another fantastic, bringing in those real sherry notes into the, into the putting as well. So they did some really interesting and amazing things with putting at one point, and they still do with this at Mountain Strength. It's a great kind of mixing kind of, if like thinking about this with kind of certain types of cocktails, even like to me, it would uh, hark back to like a cachaça, which would be a Brazilian um, sugar cane juice alcohol. Hark, harks back to that as well to create like, you could make something like almost like an interesting mojito off of this if you wanted. And I'm so glad I can talk, go back to the guys in the distillery and let them know that after Michael's research and development, we can now find out that you do light it on the back of a spoon. <laughs> um, I'm actually, I have a, quite a, a, nearly a few in a bottle here. I'm actually tempted to pour myself another drop of it, but knowing that we've got a few more whiskeys to go. And yeah, we might wait till the end on that. It's till the end. But it's actually, yeah, it's very drinkable. And... Um, Dara's question there, there are many distilleries. There are a few distilleries around Ireland. So um, obviously Michael mentioned Dave Mulligan already. Uh, he's got his Bon Putching. You have, and Dave is fantastic. Dave opened um, 1661 over there just off Cable Street, just more or less down the road from Michael kind of. And um, he, uh, he, he, he has his Bon Putching and, my, and Dave is a real kind of proponent for Putching and he does a fantastic job at selling it and marketing and if you wanted to try putchings dave has a fantastic selection there when we do eventually get to return back to pubs uh, 1661 really is kind of one of ireland's leading kind of cocktail spirit bars and definitely putching bars and um, you have mickle coming from goy connemara men like myself um interesting story when the guys from the family came in to sell it sell their putting to me in dublin a couple of years ago when i was working in a pub and uh he was kind of amazed when I said to him, like, oh, geez, it was a bit nicer the first time I tried it. And he was looking at me going, what do you mean? What? And in a real Connemara man's kind of accent, what do you mean? Um, I was like, well, I've had this before. And he goes, what are you talking about? His brother, I'd actually known from Connemara and his brother had given me the stuff. They, they were traditional putting makers. Their grandfather used to make it. Their father used to make it. So I'd had the stuff that they literally made out the back of their house before they were making it legally. Um, but they have a fantastic distillery up there in Galway. They've actually literally even, interesting enough, just laid down the first whiskey in Galway in over 100 years. They did it last week, uh, which is going to be very exciting to get whiskey out of Galway again. But um, you have there, Mikkel, you have Bon, you have uh, Mad March Hare as well, uh, Glenn's a lot. 
you know what? There's definitely one or two more that I'm not thinking of right now, but there's a good kind of market for it there as well. Said so if you really wanted to try stuff, 1661 is your place to go. It's Ireland's real kind of figurehead put team there. Now, as we're going through, I don't really want to start kind of rushing people. I don't want to be making people move along Tipperary, Stewie, call. Um, I don't really want to be rushing people. Like you've got a drama in front of you, enjoy it, relax. Um, what I will say is as we go on, I'll kind of develop it through and we'll start talking about a few things. So I am going to start moving through and I'm going to move on to the double barrel. But what I'm going to do is if you want to stick to the putting for the moment, stick to the putting for the moment. If you want to move on to the double barrel, move on to the double barrel. Kind of as, as we go as well, like we'll talk about the products, we'll talk about the individualistic kind of ideas behind the products. But I'll give you a little background story, maybe on a little bit of whiskey, a little bit of tidbits, and even on the Glendalough distillery itself. So as we're progressing through now, I'm just going to give a little introduction to the Glendalough distillery. So I'm saying stick with the putzing if you want, or jump onto the whiskey for yourself. So the Glendalough distillery itself was actually founded nine years ago. And it was an idea for four best friends to really kind of create something themselves. And they really wanted to get into that distilling business. Like I said, they actually set out to be a whiskey business, made their putting. And then when Irish gin started to kind of uh, grow, they really went after the gin. And everything about Glendalough is an expression of nature. The gins, an expression of the Glendalough region and the botanicals they can get there. The whiskies are all expressions of wood. And as obviously we'll talk about the pot still and the 25 year old expressions of Irish wood, but even the, the double, triple and the 17 are expressions of originality in wood. And the guys were all about that, coming back to nature and everything that they do and everything that they wanted to do. The brand itself is built on the Glendalough region and built on one man who was St. Kevin. Now people probably have, are probably aware of Glendalough. They've probably been up to Glendalough. The UNESCO Heritage Protected Site, uh, just south of the Dublin, up in the mountains. And it's a gorgeous area. It's, it's a, like I said, it's UNESCO Heritage Protected. So it's, it's one of not many in the world. You're not allowed to develop around it. You're not allowed to build around it. You need to kind of protect that area for the natural beauty that it is. But St. Kevin is the man. Every time you look at a bottle, and you can see on the front of every one of our little taster bottles, we see that man standing there with his arms outstretched. That man is St. Kevin. And there's an amazing story about St. Kevin where he was actually a member of Leinster royalty. And upon his birth, when he went to get baptized, they say an angel appeared at his baptism and they told his parents, you must name your child Kevin. So, you know, when something like that happens, you know, this person is going to be a special person. Um, so as they said, as he grew, he always had a kind of a want to help people and to be there for people. And um, so he decided to turn his back on that royal blood and he wanted to join the church and he was deaconized. After being deaconized, he decided he wanted to become one with nature. So he went into the Glendalough Mountains and spent seven years living in the site that is the Glendalough UNESCO protected site now. In those seven years, he built seven churches. Um, and this kind of is the stories of St. Kevin as we go. The stories of him carving out uh, St. Kevin's bed, which is in the mountain, which he used to sleep in to protect himself in the middle of a storm. And then there's a story of St. Kevin in which he used to go out onto the lake, top lake in Glendalough every day and pray. And when he'd go out to pray, he'd stretch his arms out wide and he'd stand on that lake and pray. But one of the days, a bird landed in his hand and laid some eggs. And when this bird laid its eggs, it, um, Kevin seen this as a sign from God. This was a test from God. So he had to sit there, well, stand there with his hands outstretched in the lake, waiting for the bird's eggs to hatch. Now, I don't know exactly how many days it was. People will say it's seven. Seven is a number that repeats constantly within the Glen, within, within Glen Dalton, the stories of it. But he stood there and waited for the eggs to hatch until the birds could fly away. And he's seen this as a test from God from himself. Now, when we start talking about our whiskies, we do talk about expressions of wood and what we do with our barrels and where our barrels come from. So looking at the double barrel whiskey, we're going to start off with our nose. For me, nice and smooth, not too overpowering. It's still 42% ABV. There's still a bit of strength in this, but it has a great color in it. A lovely golden kind of hue out of it. On the nose, I get kind of fruits. I get dried fruits. I get a bit of sweetness, even a bit of orange. Now, an important thing as well, whenever you're doing these types of tastings, you know what? I can talk about these types of flavors, but somebody here might get something so different. But that's all okay, because we all taste in a different way, because taste is actually associated with memory. So I might turn around and I might say, you know, this tastes of something uh, 
different or this taste of orange and dried fruits where you might have a different say memory associated to what you're tasting so you might i might taste one thing you might taste something else and it's very very different and that's okay that is how we taste that is fully acceptable to how we taste so just because i say something don't be very afraid to kind of say oh i get something else is it a blend so it's dewey's first question this is actually a majority corn malt so Irish whiskey law will dictate that we must have barley in here. This is about 90% corn to 10% barley. So that's going to give us a very different mouthfeel, going to give us a very different style of sweetness in this. It gives you kind of that creamy kind of mouthfeel as well. So even when we take in our first taste, it kind of washes for me, washes straight over my tongue, washes over my mouth, but lingers there a little bit and gives us a kind of a different kind of context within flavor because it's not that kind of barley forward. When we're talking about the double barrel, John you jumped ahead of me there. When we talk about the double barrel, the double barrel is two types of barrel used to make this whiskey. So we've got a bourbon and a sherry cask. And this really is that expression of wood. So a bourbon cask is gonna give us very kind of sweet kind of notes of flavors. So it gives us burnt sugars, it gives us vanillin. So vanillin is a part of wood that, is, that when we char our barrels, it uh, chars with it, it burns with it. So you can always kind of say from a bourbon barrel, you're going to get burnt sugars, creme brulees, caramel kind of notes out of it. And for me, I get big kind of vanilla and kind of burnt sugars out of this. What, there's a lot of caramel in here, as in, as in a flavour, not as in a, a colouring agent. No, no colouring agent. We're okay with that. It's all natural colour. Um, but you give those burnt sugars. The second barrel is a sherry cask. And we'll talk a little bit more about kind of the differences in woods and how these woods kind of impact. It's an Oroso sherry, Stewie. Um, so we get a sherry cask here. This sherry cask is gonna deliver dried fruits. It's gonna deliver sultanas, raisins, oranges, a bit of kind of spice to it as well. Anybody else getting anything else? It's really like a tail of two whiskies. You do get that sort of vanilla, that caramel, and then it changes very quickly into that sort of spicy raisin mm. sultana, the dried fruit. So, and it, it finishes on that sort of sherry profile, doesn't it? And it starts off bourbon and finishes finishes well on the on the sherry side. It's 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 well well matured or well put together, shall I say? Yeah, one hundred percent. Like. You can, and everybody can kind of question like what, it, it, listen, it's each their own as well, what we all like. We're all going to like different styles of whiskeys. And like some people love that bourbon cask. Some people love that sherry cask, um, port cask. Me personally, like you put like a red wine cask, like the Tipperary Rioja cask, love it. I love red wine cask wines. So it's all kind of very much to what people like. Is it a question in there? Um, is it a distillate uh, putting both barrels or a mix of two from the two barrels? So Alan, it's not. It's actually, um, the, the whiskey is distilled. It's aged in bourbon for three years and then it's aged in sherry for two. So we take it out of the bourbon cask and we reintroduce it into the sherry casks. Question there, Michael, for a price point for yourselves and Mulligans. I'm just going to put up a, a link there into the chat to take you to the, the web page with all the whiskies on it with the prices there. And uh, that just make it a bit easier for people who want to check the prices. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure myself. <laughs> but it's, on, it's, it's on that link there. I should open it myself and see. <laughs> Uh, some really nice comments coming in there, guys. Um, being very drinkable, being quite sink. Somebody said it would work very good with a whiskey. Sorry, with a steak. <laughs> it's a good kind of sit down whiskey. Um, it, and this is like, this to us is, I don't know what you want to call it. And I'd be very kind of wary to say our entry level. This is our, our first off in our whiskeys. <clears throat> this is our start of our journey. And it was something that we did really want to create quite specially. Something that we did want to have a really big impact on what we were doing because I don't know, this is our, our kind of lowest uh, costing whiskey. So it is our entry level to, to our portfolio. So we really want to kick off with a bang as well and what we're doing. Not that anything kind of goes down, but we wanted to make sure when we started, we started really well and we gave good flavor in our whiskey. It, it's 40 euro a bottle. Um, I think that's really good value. 100%. 100%. Um, just delivering those kind of sugars, like... <clears throat> 
as we're talking about whiskeys and as we're talking about the different whiskeys we go through, like people will kind of harp on to, you know, how often is it um, distilled? What way is it distilled? How, what shape is the still? What's the mash bill going in here? Mash bill is very, very important, but it's really the, the, the flavor in our whiskeys come from partially the mash bill, but a lot from the barrels that we use. And the barrels are really the key thing. And that's what Glenn's not really want to, really want to hang on to is the barrels are kind of like the most important part of what we do here. We're trying to, our flavor profile is an expression of the barrels that we're using and how we develop our flavors. The mash bill is important. And it's like within Glendalot, we're very, very transparent. Obviously we're only open, uh, we're only working about eight, nine years. We've only had a whiskey still for a couple of years. So all the all our distilling was actually contract distilled. And um, it was uh, through the Cooley distillery initially. And now we were getting our liquid from West Cork up uh, a lot of this kind of double barrel, triple barrel whiskey is coming from West Cork as well. And we're very, very open to say that, to say exactly where we stand with it. Um, but it was all contract distilled to our specification. We now do have a still running in our distillery in Glenzalaw. Um, we still still out of Newtown Mount Kendi, but it was done just while we were setting up our, our, dist our distillery and getting everything running. Um, did it win? Did it do well at World Whiskey Awards? Uh, Fran, it did, but I'm not going to lie to you. Off the very top of my head, I can't think of exactly what they got. So what I'll do is I'm going to pull something up in the background here um, as I'm talking to you, and I'll check exactly what it got. Uh, it's probably one of the things, like two things I'm probably terrible at remember. Sometimes I mix up ABVs, and other times when it comes to the awards and stuff, I can just never think of uh, what we got as we did them. Um, wait one sec. I think been too long looking for this now. Um, so as we're talking about the double barrel, we can move start moving into the triple barrel as well. Unless anybody has any other questions right on the double barrel, any comments? Any are we liking it? Are we not liking it? And it, listen, it's perfectly okay to say, you know, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe it doesn't hit my palate. Graham, love it. Fantastic. We want to hear. But everything is subjective here. And even, you know, at the very start, somebody's even saying like a drop of water for the putching and somebody will tell you, oh, you know, you can't add uh, water to whiskeys and you can't add this and you can't add that. Everything is really in each of their own type of thing. Like I'm never going to tell a person how to drink something, what you like, what you don't like. Uh, I might kill somebody if you're going to put like a Red Bull on top of a 17 year old whiskey, but that's another thing in itself. But you know, everything is subjective to yourself. Mulligan, uh, Mulligan? I seen the comment in from Den Mulligan there, so I got that in my head. Uh, whiskey is very subjective in itself. And actually adding a little drop of water brings down the ABV, which gives us something of a kind of a different kind of flavor profile as well and what we're doing. So when you're actually tasting, if you're tasting whiskeys for, um, as, a, as a whiskey taster to, before bottling, you're bringing it down to about 10, 12% ABV. So you can get a full impact of the flavor uh, to what you want to do with it. So it, it's always like, if you want to put in water, water mellows it out and it creates very, very different kind of flavor tones first. Now, the awards that we had on this, there was a gold medal in the 2017 San Francisco Spirits Competition, a gold medal in the 2015 San Francisco Spirits Competition. And in 2015, we got a gold medal for Irish single grain uh, whiskey at the Irish Whiskey Awards. So a good kind of credential sitting behind this whiskey as well. I'm on my way down to Redmond's to pick up a bottle of Double Barrel. Damien, do you know what? I literally live about two minutes from Redmond's. Uh, we might, it might be closed by the time we get there, but uh, I'll see you there if we can. <laughs> so moving on to the Triple Barrel. Why would we go to Redmond's when we can get it from Mulligan's? Yeah, just go to that link and you can buy it from the website. I'll, exactly. I'll <laughs> exactly. Graeme Ryan, Alan, would you mind showing us how to taste whiskey? You know what, Graeme? It's a great call. It's probably something I should have done at the start. A lot of these things you just presume kind of people. So when we're tasting whiskey, even better, I'm going to move on to the triple barrel as I'm going to do this. And I'm going to take it with the triple barrel. Um, first comment there, Jonathan Ramirez, lovely nose. So Graham, as we're talking about tasting, right? So our first off is we're going to take a look at our color and we're going to nose it. So color first for me, maybe a little bit lighter in kind of color on this one than the double barrel. The double barrel for me was a little bit bolder in color. It could literally be the floor that I'm watching it against. So you kind of go against the white wall if you can um, to get your color kind of profile. As I was saying, we're going to take, we're going to pass it over our nose just to get that smell first. If you really want to get a, a real kind of, when you're looking at kind of spirits and stuff, if you really kind of encapsulate that glass with your hand as well, Michael's just shown up the triple barrel bottle there for us to see. 
um, as you kind of heat it up a little bit, the aroma, the, the vapor kind of starts to come out of it as well. So we get a little bit kind of more on the nose. Then when we're going to taste, so there's something that I do personally, some people do, some people don't. When I take my first taste, what I do is I leave it sitting on my tongue and I take a breath in. When it, so with whiskey, sorry, with wine, when people do a taste and you hear them kind of gurgle it a little bit or kind of you hear a noise, that's not what I'm trying to do here. What I'm trying to do here is I want to just take a breath in after I take it. So what's going to happen is the ethanol vapor is going to pass straight through and come straight down my throat. We don't leave, we leave the whiskey in our mouth. When we do that, we're going to get a vapor. Some people will actually start coughing and stuff, depending on the strength of this. This is a 42%, so it's not light in any way or form. But then when we take our second taste, what we've done is we've kind of tasted the ethanol already and we get a better understanding of the liquid within it itself. So like I was saying, our first taste is just going to be straight in. Breathe past and swallow. And then my second taste, to me, it gives me a little bit more kind of a rounder kind of spirit idea of the liquid within that. Some great comments coming in there. Uh, seven up on the nose, lovely green apple. Um, you need a big leather chair to taste it right. You're right, Dara. You're really onto this, aren't you? Um, seven up on the nose, lovely green apple. So like what we're getting straight away is we're getting um, those, kind of, those kind of fruit notes, that kind of citrus, that apple, all those kind of fruity notes coming through. So what makes this a triple barrel is the addition of a Madeira cask. So what we're gonna get is, we're gonna get our burnt sugars again, our vanillas, our caramels, our creme brulees. We're gonna get our sherry cask, which is our dried fruits, and then Madeira. So it adds a sweetness to it. It does add a really kind of sweet aroma to it as well. We're still on the same mash bill. We're on a majority corn mash bill. So we're gonna get that real round mouthfeel. And it's going to bring a different kind of flavor for us. For me personally, it almost kind of bitters the flavor. It's a little bit more bitter than the double barrel, where the double barrel was maybe a little bit more smoother, rounder in its flavor. For me, I get a little bit of bitterness out of this. And again, that is just me personally. But in the way it kind of is delivered, it's to be that extra kind of progression from the double barrel, to give us an extra little bit of flavor from the double barrel. Sharper, a good kind of word to use as well there, Kevin. That's that kind of bitterness that I'm getting. It does have a bit of a sharpen in it, a sharpness to it. <laughs> no one understands why it's sold out everywhere. Brian, you prefer the double barrel? That's that's all right as well. Um, when we're looking at kind of these types of wood as well, and you know, wood is a great expression of our whiskies. Um, wood is a great expression of our whiskies and it's how we try to develop our whiskies and wood can really be a massive, massive thing. You'd be amazed. So whiskey, Joe, you know, like when we distill, um, it's a cast of six, uh, Colin, I'll come back to you on that question in a second as well. Um, when we actually distill, distilling is a science. It's boiling, it's uh, up to uh, 80 degrees to get that vapor out of our alcohol to leave our water behind. It's a science. Putting whiskey in barrel is a science as well. But what happens in that barrel is nature and it's art. And that like, we don't know what's going to happen inside that barrel. And we don't know what's going to go on. Like you could get some, you could put six different barrels down at exactly the same time and get different colors and get different flavors and get everything so different out of it each time. And that's why like blending whiskey is such a big thing because you want to create that consumers sometimes want that real consistent flavor. Um, the general consumer wants that consistent flavor, but the whiskey fan understands and appreciates the variety that you can get out of it as well. And it was in, obviously being natural color as well can really vary as well. People say, oh, a darker color means a better whiskey, but natural color is really kind of a sign of um, skill and craftsmanship. But that kind of nature impact inside that barrel can be so wide reaching in what we do. So by using different types of wood, it creates different types of flavors, different types of chairs. So those bourbon casks we're talking about, that bourbon cask is actually a wild turkey barrel from wild turkey bourbon distillery. It's been used for bourbon once. It's had a level four chair. I know this because uh, it is the um, same bourbon that we rep that I represent as well. It's a level four chair, so it's a deeper high heat chair. So we're gonna really get into that wood and get those burnt sugars up. Then we take a uh, um, sherry barrel and we uh, take the flavor from that. And that is gonna give us um, those dried fruits. It's a toasted barrel as well though. So it's only done to like a level two chair. 
So that's not going to give us those burnt sugars. That's going to give us more kind of lighter, mellower, woodier notes. And the Madeira cask is a um, toasted barrel as well. So again, that's going to give us, and that's probably where we're getting a little bit more of that kind of sharpness, a little bit more of that wood, a little bit more of that bitterness coming through because we're not getting those heavy sugars because we're not charring the barrel really heavily. Uh, Alan, quite different from the other barrel, very different. That real edition. So it is three years aged in uh, bourbon, one year in Oroso Sherry, and one year in Madeira. Uh, Stewie, is, is this a blend? Again, yeah, it's that corn to barley blend. And the impact of these woods, like as we continue to talk about woods, we'll talk about the Mizanora, we'll talk about the Irish. American and European oak has a massive impact on whiskies as well. American oak, when you think about a tree, in an American forest, you think about those big tall oaks. Those big tall oaks grow really, they grow really, really tall. Not as broad as you would get a European oak. So the grains in that wood are a lot tighter. So you don't get as much permeation in the wood. The liquid doesn't pass through the wood as easy and as quickly. And um, so it has a very different impact to the sherry oak. When you think of like a sherry oak tree, it's a big broader kind of trunk. So that's going to give us a different flavor again because the wood can pass through. The liquid can pass through that wood differently to the wood, the bourbon. So it opens up into that wood. It sits in the wood a little bit longer. Like when you're looking at barrel aging, it's almost like a sponge. So as it gets uh, hotter, the, the barrel uh, pulls in the whiskey. As it gets colder, it pushes back out the whiskey. So it's constantly pushing and pulling, pushing and pulling. So the, the type of wood we use can have a big impact. Think about the kind of the, the, the size of the rings in the wood and the gaps within that wood, the grains within that wood have a big impact on what happens as well. And that's how we create our flavor profiles and what we do. So the sherry barrels have been left sitting for about a year. The sherry sits in it for, sorry, sherry sits in it for two years um, and then it passes back out. Uh, then it passes on to us for our bourbon and our Madeira is two years as well. And then it passes back out for us for our whiskey, not for our bourbon. What is the blend exactly of? It's 90% uh, corn to 10% uh, barley on the grain blend. The blend within, so this is again, it's just, it's passed from barrel to barrel to barrel. So we don't mix the liquids and um, they all just pass through. So it literally sits in a bourbon barrel for three years. Then it'll sit in a uh, sherry cask for a year. And then it'll sit into uh, the Madeira cask for you. Anybody, any questions or any thoughts here? It's amazing how similar but different they are. Have you, have you know what I mean? That they've gone through a very similar process, but that little bit of addition in Madeira completely changes it. I mean, I, I like both of them, and, but I, I'm sort of edging on the double barrel a little bit. And I do myself, to be honest, I do myself. Um, the, the, and it's, it's all down to personal flavors and what people like. Um, but it can be something very kind of different than what we do. Um, and it, it's, it's personal flavors. It's very different to what we all like and what we all enjoy. To me, I do like, I love bourbon cask. I love that kind of sherry cask. I'm not as big a fan of Madeira. Like I said, I look like I will, I'll go wild for red wine cask. I love red wine cask wine, uh, whiskey. Um, but it's all really down to what you like and the flavors that comes out for it. Um, sorry, I actually think I actually misread a question. Sorry, Damien, what is a blend exactly, Alan? So you'll have different types of blends. So your blend first can be your, your mash bill and your mash bill is the type of grain that you're using. And then your other blend can be your barrels. So um, with the, it can be a blend of barrels. So we'll take um, a very large Sicilian Ireland and it's, it's not a big secret. Jameson will age in bourbon, sherry and uh, port and they will literally just kind of uh, age it and then nearly kind of mix it together after that so that can be a blend of barrels but you also have your mash bill which is your blend of grain um That's how does fun. second fill cask whiskies compare to first fill fran um you get a bigger impact of wood and the best example i can use that as we go on are going to be the Mizor mizanora and the pot still they're first fill casks so we're going to have first fill Mizanora and a first fill uh, Irish oak postal. So you will get a better kind of impact of understand that. First fill um, casks give you more flavor. They give you like straight away. But you also have, so when we're making whiskey and an understanding for whiskey as well is when we talk about age statements is we have something called um, an angel share. And some of you may have heard of angel share before. Angel share is evaporation from a barrel. 
So when we leave our whiskey sitting in our barrels, in Ireland, we lose on average 3% out of a barrel every year. So literally the liquid that's in that barrel evaporates out and disappears into the skies. That's why it's called the angel shares. If you're ever in a rack house or a storehouse or barrels, you'll always see what looks kind of like a black moss on the roof. It's not as actually the whiskey has evaporated, hit the roof and condensed back down and just stuck kind of stood right there and stayed there. And you always get that kind of musky kind of nose when you're ever in a, in a, in a barrel house or a rack house or warehouse. And that's why. But that barrel, when you've used a first fill, when you're putting that first liquid into a barrel, that barrel, you get a bigger rate of loss as well because that barrel sucks in the whiskey and it holds some of it too. So if you ever look at a barrel stave, you'll always see a line within that stave and there's liquid that will always sit in that barrel. So it imparts bigger flavor because it's the first time it's touching that wood, but you do lose a little bit as well. Second fill, you're getting a flavor impairment from what was in there originally and then you're getting the flavor from the wood. Uh, now it doesn't like diminish it massively on a first fill and second fill. So when you start hitting like fourth, fifth fills, you kind of go, right, maybe the wood's not having the impact here anymore. Wood starts to crack, things start to happen. Um, but on the first fill, a first fill and second fill, there's a big difference because you're literally getting that first touch of wood in there. And it was one of the problems we had with the pot still, which we'll talk about in a moment. Is this a core range stuff or was done once? The, Triple barrel uh, was a core range for us. We're in the middle of, um, so it's liquid sourcing can be an issue and trying to get the right liquids. And we're at the Madeira that we have. We also have a Madeira cask range uh, that we do. That's not the triple barrel. And there's just decisions going on right now. Do we want to continue the triple barrel or swap it over to a Madeira single cask? So right now the triple barrel um, is available, but things could change on it. Um, and then if we start looking at the Madeira single cask, hey, we might just have to do another tasting. That'd be a shame, wouldn't it, for a Friday night? Anybody else with any other questions? A Madeira, a Madeira barrel would be excellent just on it in its own right. That sounds fantastic, actually. Yeah. And the, the imagination we have out there in barrels right now show how important the barrels are. Like, we see what Teeling do using rum barrels, and they, they, their expressions of barrels are just amazing in what they do. And we see playing around with barrels everywhere. I already spoke about the Tipperary with the Rioja people really are kind of playing around with barrels and it gives you such a, like people think Irish whiskey, like it's like anybody thinks Irish whiskey is Irish whiskey, Scots whiskey is Scots whiskey, bourbon's bourbon. But you can have so many, like we know in Ireland, you can have a pot still, you can have a single malt, you can have any, any sort of mash bill range that you're working with already. You can have uh, something coming off a column still, you can have continuous stills, you can have everything. So just because it's, it's categorized as one thing, like I hate when somebody will tell me, oh, I don't like Irish whiskey. Oh, I don't like Scotch whiskey. Oh, I don't like this. It's like, you, just, you haven't had enough of it to try what you like and what you don't like because you can put two, we all know you can put literally a Jameson down beside this right now and you get two different flavors. You can have like a Jameson cask mates with an IPA cask, which would be a totally different flavor. So it's not as similar going, oh, I don't like this, I don't like that. Even now we can say with distilleries, oh, I don't like what that distillery does. Okay, we might not like their distillate, but what they put into barrels can be very different than what they're doing. I think you've hit the nail on the head with that one because a lot of the stuff I've had for West Cork, I, I, I've always thought I can spot a West Cork straight away with this sort of nuttiness, but it's not, it's not, it's, you've sort of proved that that doesn't happen. I, the, the story character doesn't really happen. Because once you start putting things into barrels and you know, you're know you taking all them flavours out of the wood, it, it completely changes the spirit, you know? And I, I, I would never guess they were from, you know, from West Cork based on tasting them. They're completely against what I would assume what West Cork is, you know? Well, I'll tell you, Michael, these ones were, they, they were originally out of Cooley. So it is more to the, and it was contract distilled. So it wasn't necessarily distilled. We didn't buy liquid off West Cork. They kind of made it for us. So it would have had a difference to what West Cork kind of do as well. And that was very important to us as well, that we wanted to have our kind of liquid rather than just saying, oh, you know, it's liquid from West Cork. They contract distilled for us, but it was to our classification. Right. So what you're saying is uh, I stopped out in myself. That was probably right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're 100 percent right on it. <laughs> yeah. I think I think because I, I think we'll find out when we come to the, the single pot store. I do get that nuttiness uh, of a West Cork whiskey, and it's like ah, I, can, I immediately thought that's a West Cork whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a distillery character that sort of stands out for me. Yeah. Um, so nah, happy days, uh, everybody. I hope you I hope you've enjoyed that uh, the first three sort of first. I'm not going to say first three whiskeys because one wasn't a whiskey, but. The first few drinks are uh, really interesting. I, I personally, I really love that double barrel. And actually, I'm lucky enough, I don't have small samples. I have the, the bottles of the from. So I actually poured myself 
another double barrel after I finished the triple barrel there because it's really, really enjoyable whiskey, you know. I, would, I wouldn't have guessed that it was as young as it is. Um, there's lots of flavour in there. And it's, you know, it's it's really, really nice. It's, and a, you know, 40 quid a bottle. You know, that's really, really good. <laughs> okay, guys. So what we can do is at this point, we do have another three to go. So if we wanted to take uh, five minutes for ourselves, we can take a little kind of break. And if anybody needs to grab a drop of water for themselves, wash your palates, if you want to do whatever you need to do. Um, and we'll catch you all back here. So it's 20 past now. We'll save in half past to give everybody enough time. We'll see you all back in about, yeah, five or six minutes. Perfect. Thanks, Alan. I, know that. Actually, I loved even getting the break for myself there, Michael. I was looking at your own countrymen. Yeah, they're, they're, I see there are, there are a few points ahead. Yeah, I'm not aware Scotland are playing France in a, in a rugby match this evening, so um, it doesn't matter. England can only only finish fifth, so that's the yeah. meme, you know. Yeah, I seen a great meme today. It was like all all the eventualities, and everyone was just like <laughs> England finished fifth. It's fine. Okay, so I hope everybody has enjoyed the first half of our evening, and now like these are definitely going to be the ones that. Uh, are very exciting to taste. If you like the double barrel and you like the triple barrel and you like the putching, these are definitely going to be something for everybody to try. Um, very, very interesting whiskeys came in here. Um, Linda, I skipped ahead. It's multi delight. <laughs> so what we're going to start off first with is we're going to start off with our 17-year-old Miss Anora. So this is a definite expression of wood, as I keep calling things, but um, this is quite different as well. In Michael has that beautiful bottle there as well. If anybody hasn't seen it, even look at the link for the Mulligan site, you get this gorgeous bottle in a great, fantastic case, and it's just something so, so special. But what this is, is Mizunora. So what is Mizunora? Mizunora is a Japanese wood. Uh, Jonathan, you're jumping ahead. Coconut, definite coconut in this. Um, and to give you a kind of a little backstory, just as we're getting on, onto our taste, so I'll stop giving the backstories and have a taste first, and then you can all sip along as I'm talking. Coconut, definitely. Big, bold, kind of dark kind of flavor, kind of like a dark cherry for me. But really just, it's a round, bold, bodied flavor, but not overpowering as well. And this again, 43% ABV, 46% ABV, what am I saying? really kind of you don't get that strength you're not getting like we've gone now from 42 percent double barrel trip barrel up to 46 percent you're not catching that jump fantastic on the nose well i got a bang of pineapple there mm -hmm. on the taste then as well just i get personally i'm getting fruit i'm getting the likes of uh apricot orange uh coconut co coconut massively on the nose chocolate a little bit um spice wood spice oriental spice and uh, jonathan you will come to that part as well was it in this for long but really kind of give gonna give it it's, it's a big flavored whiskey it's a full flavor whiskey as a kind of a note to this this 17 year old is only brand new in the last year we did previously have a, a 13 year old as a, out of mizanora cask and it actually received uh, best irish whiskey and it uh, landed in the top 20 whiskeys in the world uh, a few years ago so it really came out of a big kind of bow uh, out of a big kind of applaud for this whiskey in a 13 year old so this 17 year old is something different again um tastes last in your mouth for ages lovely hurling you're right Graham now to give you just to give you an understanding of this like at first all the comments that are coming through are great fruit it is fruit it's, it's full-on fruit saying I'm getting chocolate orange apricots uh, mango oriental spice Vanilla still coming through, lactone, everything just, it, it's, it's, it's an explosion of flavor, really is. But uh, sour apple even as well, yeah, Rory, um, it is just kind of all coming through. And like, even there's things I'll say, like, I'm not even tasting, but you know, Rory, the second you said sour apple, sour apple there, I'm like, yeah, you're right, it is there. And it's amazing, like, even doing these things can let you catch things that you never caught before. I only literally had my first taste of this only a couple of weeks ago as well, and I was, I wanted more, so I'm even happier to be having some right now. So of this 17 year, just we'll answer the first question there. This spends 13 years in bourbon cask, again in that char four barrel, and four years in Mizanora uh, to create this flavor. Now, 
to give you an idea of Mizunora, um, Mizunora is a Japanese style of wood. Uh, it's a very, very protected style of wood. Uh, it, on average, the barrels, the wood that you're taking from American oak is about 80 to 100 years. Irish oak is about 100 to 120 years to grow the trees high enough to get these. On average, out of a, like a, an oak tree in America, you get maybe four, five, six, average four barrels out of a tree. When you ever look at a tree, to give you an idea, when you ever look at an oak tree, the part that you make the barrel from is from the ground, from just below the, the, the roots on the ground to where you hit the first branch. They're the only part that you can actually make the barrel from. It's not like an entire tree. And the Mizunora cask is quite different because the wood is so hard to use. Um, Mizunora actually translate as uh, water wood, as water oak. So the wood is actually so hard to use that uh, you only generally get like one, maybe two barrels out of a Mizunora tree but the trees themselves grow for 200 years. So this is a 200 year old tree um, that we're drinking, that this whiskey went into. And these barrels have like uh, such an amazing flavor from them. But because of that kind of structure of the wood, you have to literally chop them down and leave them sitting for about three years just to air dry. In America, they'll kill and dry barrels within a couple of weeks, couple of months. Here in Japan, they keep the wood there for three years just to air dry in itself. Uh, we make punchings out of this, uh, punching barrels out of this, and it is a virgin Mizunara cask that the first fills are going into. So it's a first fill barrel was the original um, that these went into. So it's the first liquid to touch this. And Mizunara is such an unusual thing to use because the grain in the wood, it was about the grain in America in, and we talk about the uh, grain in um, European cask. Uh, the grain in this, so this water oak, as it's called, is so unusual that you need, in America, after they make, so when they make a bourbon barrel, it takes them an average of about a um, couple of minutes to sure test up a barrel. Mizunora cast takes a couple of months because you don't know how the wood is going to react. You can make a full barrel, you put whiskey in, and all of a sudden it just shoots out, literally seeps through the wood, not even through the gaps in the staves, seeps through the wood. So it has such a very, very different kind of uh, uh, profile to its wood, but that's what gives it that big flavor. Like th this soaks the entire wood. We're on top of in an American barrel, you see that line, that seam in the middle where the liquid soaks into. This actually kind of soaks into the entire wood and pushes in and out. And that's what gives this such amazing flavor. And these particular barrels have a beautiful story about them. So you have, um, uh, now, let me make sure that I can get this name right because I don't want to do any disservice to anybody. And I'm even wary about saying these names. Hidetoshi Itabushi uh, is one of the oldest experienced Coopers in Japan. And uh, his family are still the only family run Cooperage in Japan. The guys from Glendala went up, went to Japan and actually spent. Uh, two months in Japan, working with him, learning how he coopers his barrels, learning how he did everything, because he is so precious about this barrel that he will not let it out of the country of Japan unless he trusts the people that are taking the barrels. The guys had to earn their trust with him uh, for two months, spending time literally living with him, uh, making these barrels with him, coopering these barrels with him, before he would actually allow them to take the barrels out of the country and bring them back to Ireland. And that's how protective he is of this. It's a really tight style of grain, but it, because it's such a tight style of grain, again, it's harder to cooper. It's harder to flex and to bend. So what you do when you're making a barrel is you generally steam the wood to get it to bend into that kind of barrel shape they're used to. So don't forget, these are straight um, planks of wood the staves come out of. So they had to do so much just so he would actually allow them to take these barrels out of Japan, to bring them to Ireland, so we could sit here and have this whiskey right now. So not only did we have 200 years of growing the wood, we had three years of air drying the wood. The guys had to spend two months before they were allowed to take the barrels out of Japan. And then there was 13 years of aging, sorry, 17 years of aging, 13 years in bourbon, and then the four years that we've had it in the Mizunora cask. So it's taken what a combination of what 217, 217 and a half, call it years, for us to drink this whiskey right now.
So I'll let that settle in with people as well. I was only a glint in my grandfather's 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 eye at this point. Like I say, and on that, getting that real creaminess as well. So this is actually when we're talking about the um, when we're talking about the the mash bill on this, it is back to a barley mash bill to start off. We don't have that corn influence here. We're on a full Irish barley mash bill of two to one uh, malted to malted grain. Um, and then it's literally said age in the bourbon for 13 and then the Mizanar for four. And it just brings a big kind of flavor profile to this. That's just so special that even an hour there, is it worth every second of waiting? For me, it is, yeah, 100%. Anybody else with any other thoughts there? So fruity, big body, 100%, Kevin, 100%. Michael, is this taking your breath away there, has it? Or, uh... <laughs> Sorry, someone just sent me a message saying that um, uh, one of the whiskeys was shown out as out of stock. And uh, oh, okay. unfortunately, I hit the wrong button on all the whiskeys on the Glendalough website. <laughs> Sorry, on the, on the website. So basically, I had every Glendalough product we have tonight available for sale, but you couldn't buy it because I hit the wrong button. <laughs> so I had to go through every product we had tonight just there in the last two minutes. And that's why I went quiet, changing all. So it's, it's, the website is fixed. So you can, if you do want to buy it, you can buy it. Uh, but Alan, it is a phenomenal whiskey. And I was just thinking before I had to go and do that, um, we, we do uh, at the end of the year, I know we've got a long way to go, um, but we always have our whiskey of the year. And uh, I said, we have a contender. Uh, in this, Good to hear. Uh, it's phenomenal. Um, I'll certainly be purchasing more of this and keeping it aside because I I generally see this appearing on our whiskey of the year, which is basically we take out the top five whiskies of all the whiskey tastings we do over the course of the year, and we put them up against each other for a phenomenal tasting. This is without a doubt, it's it's going to be in there. Uh, if you think of last year. Um, you know, we know my I'm a fan of Highland Park and we've had our own Highland Park single cask. And that's an amazing drop. That didn't even make it into the whiskey of the year last year. So oh, wow, you know, okay. so it's it's a phenomenal whiskey. This for me is, you know, we've got a lot of tastings lined up for the rest of the year, but I can pretty much pretty I'm pretty certain this is going to be in the top five or top six anyway. It's 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 going to be on the lineup. It's a phenomenal whiskey. It really is. Um you know, just it's as soon as you, as soon as you knows it, and that that tropical fruit, that pineapple. Someone mentioned coconut, and then someone just hit the nail on the head and said pina colada. <laughs> you know, you've got all that. You've got that vanilla. You've got that pineapple. You've got that coconut. It's just yeah, you know. It's just it's just a beautiful, beautiful whiskey. You know, and um, unfortunately, I have lots of the other ones uh, bottles that are. But this one is this is this one's gone. There's nothing in this. That's the drop of that one. Right. Um, it's a phenomenal whiskey. Well, well done. It really is. It, it yeah. It deserves a round of applause. It's, <laughs> it, it, it really is, and uh, it's a phenomenal whiskey. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, listen, it's it's something so special. Even like uh, 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 Thomas there asking, what was he making Mizanor barrels for? He's making Mizanor barrels for other whiskies. So Mizanor would have been used in Japanese whiskey as well. So Nika have a gorgeous uh, Mizanor. Bowmore had a Mizanora. Um, to give you even context on these barrels, the average Mizanora barrel will cost you um, six thousand dollars. Is the is the price equivalent I have in my mind? Um, I'm trying to think of the euro. So what? Probably about five and a half grand in euro. Um, but six thousand dollars is what you're looking at uh, for a barrel of these. And they actually started because the wood is so reactive and it's like that water oak I spoke of, it has kind of faults within the wood. You'd nearly, people were nearly chopping down multiple trees almost to make one barrel because there was faults in the staves that were coming up. Um, so the Japanese actually started, the Japanese government started to restrict the logging of Mizanora wood as well of water oak to try and restrict people from actually using up all the wood. Um, Dara, that sounds very unfortunate to hear. Uh, look, I'm 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 well open to getting some more samples in the post next week, and I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll come back with a come back with a with a, with a revision. Uh, I'll send you the empty bottle if you like. Somebody <laughs> really knows of it, you know. <laughs> it didn't look very easy to empty. I have to say, you, you're kind of like. <laughs> 
Uh, don't even go there, right? Because as we move on, uh, the last whiskey, the 25 year old, the 25 year old was actually the first whiskey I decanted into small bottles. And um, so I, I done this, I took the, the cork off and I done what I normally do. I put my porter in and then I start pouring the mini bottles. Unfortunately, it, it doesn't seal well. And so the 25 year old, a 420 euro bottle, as I poured the first whiskey out of it, there was more coming out the side of the bottle. So um, this is actually bizarre. As we come on to the, the 25 year old, we've opened three bottles of this for the tasting tonight. In order for me to get a sample of the 25 year old, what I had to do was take all the, the empty bottles and stand them upside down on each other and let them, whatever the viscosity, run down into the bottle <laughs> so that I can get that much 25 year old in my glass. You guys have got more 25 year old than me, but that we'll come to that later on, the viscosity of this whiskey because it clings to the glass of the bottle. It's, it's insane. Um, but it was a trick my grandfather told me. He worked in the bar trade for years in Scotland, and every month he would take all the bottles, the whiskey bottles uh, uh, they used, and he'd hand, have them upside down in a crate. And every week they just keep putting these bottles in the crate. And at the end of the month, they would get a litre and a half of whiskey and put it back into the bottle and stick it up on the, the dodgy blend. And you know that was the that was the cheap the cheap shot whiskey, and um, so it was a trick my grandfather told me. He says whiskey clings to the inside of the bottle. It's got a bit of viscosity. So, so I was like this morning. I was like, I've no twenty five roll for myself tonight. Get the three bottles and do what your granddad told you. And bizarrely enough, that's what happened. I managed to get a little enough for me to drink tonight. So no, at least you got your sorters anyway. <laughs> we'd, we'd hate to be sitting here and you the one man without it. <laughs> now hold on, he, he had a he had a full bottle of double barrel there left, didn't he? I think so. Uh, don't feel well, too sorry for him. <laughs> wasn't wasn't quite a full bottle, Bill. It probably was a little bit earlier on. Like, <laughs> uh, Linda's question there. I'm looking online with no looks. Let me know the average evaporation rate with Mizanora casts, with it being so porous. Um, I don't know that one. I can find out. Uh, I. But evaporation is due to the porous, porousness of the wood, but also the climate that we're in. Like a lot of kind of uh, countries, if you look at even tropical aging and everything, they say it works about three times higher than um, aging in Ireland. So I'd say climate will have as big an impact as the porous of the porousness of the wood, but it's something I can definitely find out, Linda. Um, even as we're talking about this and, you know, we're out trying to debunk myths as we go along and people will always say, you know, and nothing like this is a, a gorgeous 17 year old that we're drinking here. But that impact that even that angel share, everything actually makes to whiskey can be a big, big part of, you know, when we're looking at a 17 year old, looking at prices and stuff. It's if we were to lose 3% of that barrel every year for 17 years, there's obviously a lot less liquid in that barrel than when we started with it. And that can be a big kind of rate to price as well, is that we need to, it still costs us the same amount of money to fill that barrel, but we're taking less liquid out of it. So we need to charge a bit more for that liquid to get a bit more out of it. And so I've, I've always been a big fan of kind of saying like, just because it has a bigger age or a bigger price doesn't always mean it's better. Sometimes some of the older stuff can be maybe even too strong, too pungent. This obviously hits a very different note, but um, it's always really good to kind of look, oh, drink our whiskeys with an open mind as we're going along, just to say, well, one thing's better or not as good as another, just because of age or price. I'm sure Michael might kill me for that. He wants you buying all the expensive stuff. <laughs> in, fair, in fairness, it, it is quite an expensive whiskey, but you know, you know, if you, I think the day the days past now when you, where you put age to the price. You know, um, that, that, that day's gone, you know. If a whiskey's good enough and it's limited, it's porous, like you say, that you get a very limited amount out of the barrel, then it has to be charged accordingly. And I've always thought, I think Glendalough actually are, do charge a fair price for their whiskey, uh, especially if you, you know, you look at the, you know, the double barrel at 40 quid a bottle is excellent. And to me, the, 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 you know, the 17 to 260 bottle is, is excellent as well. You know, um, we've seen we've seen like um, some people charge four, five, six hundred, seven hundred, a thousand euro for you know similar aged whiskey. So you know, it's fair play. So we're going to move on, and we're going to move in on to our pot still. I feel so, sorry for poor pot still here now. You know, <laughs> sorry. I feel sorry for the pot still here coming, coming to live up to the expectation after that. You know. 
Well, I, I was going to preface it with some people would almost kind of, when you do these tastings, it's almost like kind of a step up in ages and flavor and everything. I wanted to kind of let the Potsdam and 25 kind of do their own thing on the side because they are expressions of Irish oak, where the double barrel, the triple barrel, the Mizanora 17 are expressions of maybe not the native woods, but the woods that they're aged in and the flavor profile we wanted to create. This is an expression of the flavor profile we wanted to create, but using Irish wood. And I, I, I by in no means would ever say, you know, it's, it's coming after this. It, it has its own kind of merits. And I know that's not what you meant, but like it's, it's, it's a fantastic whiskey in itself. So as we start off with our Irish oak, we're going to look at our color first, where the Mizanora definitely had a bolder color again. This does have a lighter kind of straw base, kind of light yellowy color for me personally. Um, and on the nose, it really has that kind of hay that somebody's called apple crumble pepper, that greenery like that. That, that you know, People always use you know, that term like fresh cut grass, hay, straw, all of that, that apple crumble, that fruitiness kind of coming through on the nose. And then to taste, get kind of like, it has a bit of spice to it, bit biscuity. You know, I was going to say buttery, but biscuity is a really good word to kind of um, describe it there as well, Rory. And this is going to sound like the almost like most basic thing anybody will ever say about a whiskey. But considering the proposition of this whiskey as being from Irish oak, to me, it's wood. Wood really carries through. Michael, you were calling kind of nuttiness earlier wood really kind of carries through in this and it's an expression of that wood and it's that first fill irish oak barrel that's going to bring that flavor uh stewies how many trees are in the set there were 14 trees felled and we'll get on to the stories of the trees in a moment uh the first seven were only released last year we're starting to, to release some of the other trees now um but before we kind of get into the story of the glendala pot still there's a kind of a story behind pot still and irish oak within itself so like I was saying earlier, pot still is a geographical kind of classification in Ireland. You can only get cognac from cognac in France. You can only get a champagne from champagne in France. You can only get pot still from Ireland. It is a classification of Ireland within itself. Um, and that's one of the bigger parts in this is we literally took the expression that was Irish whiskey. In the late 1700s to 1900s, pot still was what you got in Ireland. Eight out of every 10 barrels at that point where pot still where pot still whiskey the rules behind pot still kind of state that you must be minimum 30 percent of malted or unmalted barley and then you must be a uh, maximum of five percent of grain and then the other portion will be the opposite of what you took in your malted number so the example will be if i had a whiskey of 30 percent malted barley 65 percent unmalted barley and five percent grain that is what defines a pot still whiskey. This was actually, pot still was created as a way of getting away out of tax because there was such a high tax on malted barley at a point in, in, that, in that time period that they decided to play around with the kind of, with, with the malted and non-malted barley to appease themselves in the tax for what they wanted to create. And that really, and this brings a kind of a bolder, kind of buttier, spicier, kind of thicker kind of flavor mouthfeel. And it is something, like I said, is very original to Ireland. And I suppose when we're looking at that kind of premium whiskey market all over the world right now, pot still is to Ireland like single malt is to Scotch whiskey. You'll always hear people talking about single malt Scotch whiskey, single malt Scotch whiskey. That is that kind of premium level for us with pot still in Ireland. And that's where we want to bring it. This particular whiskey is a one to two malted to unmalted barley. So one part malted to two part unmalted barley within this. Um, and it's bottled at 43% ABV, like we see on the label, uh, because it's to avoid that chill filtering as well. We don't want to chill filter this whiskey because we find when you're chill filtering, you're just you're stripping away some certain flavors that we really want to keep in here. So it's non-chill filtered whiskey as well. Something like, oh, what's chill filtering? Chill filtering is after you take it out of the barrel and you kind of, I don't know what the, 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 the easiest way to say is you kind of sieve out your whiskey just in case there's any bits of wood and char coming from that barrel. Chill filtering would be to almost freeze it down as cold as you can to solidify out bits and get them out of there or make them rise to the top where uh, where don't we don't chill filter here. It's more like that sieving process just to make sure we remove any impurities out of it that may be solid impurities within the whiskey. 
when we looked at making an Irish oak pot still, it was to be an expression of Glendalough. Glendalough is such a beautiful area and we wanted to express Glendalough. So we went up into the mountains and we found trees. We found trees that we could chop down, that we could fell the trees. For every tree that gets chopped down in the woods, we plant another seven trees to make sure that we're sustaining the wildlife and the wilderness up there. The trees, like I said, are an average of about 120 years old in what we're using here. But the um, but when you fell these seven trees, so after by the 120 year, in and around that 100, 120 year age, when it starts to get older, you do have issues with the wood starts to deteriorate, the wood starts to fall. And when the wood starts to fall, you get um, saplings that will grow and ash, not ash, um, can't think of the type of wood right now that will grow instead. Uh, but when it starts to grow instead, it actually, it's not oak that will grow instead of it that grows out of the trees from, from the felled trees. So it's actually our way of sustaining the forest as well. That for every one we chop down, we replant seven and we stop trees from falling to let more invasive styles of wood grow within the forest. Uh, you do have to do it in a collection. So you generally collect, you kind of pin the seven around each other. Because what happens is when you, when we chop down or the 14 trees we did, we did them in two batches of seven. You want to create an opening in the canopy to let sunlight through to hit those saplings that we've planted. And we actually have to maintain those saplings as well. Within the first three years, deer and other animals can actually eat those saplings. So not only have we planted seven or seven by 14 is 68 trees. Um, we need to maintain them and keep an eye on them for three years to make sure they can grow to a strength that they just can't be uprooted by animals. The story of actually Irish oak, though, is a very interesting one. Before, our, Ireland is known as the land of saints and scholars, but a long time ago, Ireland was known as the wooded isle. It was said that a squirrel could cross the country from tree to tree, um, and you could do this very easily in Ireland. And the oak really kind of did impart some bits in Ireland. It was a signal of strength, honour, uh, truth, and endurance across Ireland. But... Like many other things in this country, we blame for our problems. We had an invasive species on our own called the English people. <laughs> but at one point, the Queen of England um, decided that uh, she would take Irish oak trees to build ships. And it would take, on average, 4,000 Irish oak trees to build one ship for her navy. And we lost uh, in excess of 60% of the trees of the oak trees in Ireland uh, due to the English uh, building naval ships. So not that we didn't have enough to blame them for, we can now blame them for the fact that we don't have enough trees either. Um, but this was, this was an outcome from uh, English control uh, in Ireland. Um, but before this, we were quite well, very well known for our trees and we were very well known for being a wooded isle. <clears throat> the type of tree that we have here, so when we talk about different kind of genus of wood, there is obviously, this is one of two whiskies in the world. There's two whiskies aged in Irish oak. You have us and you have the Milton Dare Gallic. We are both Irish oaks, but we're actually both different styles of trees. We're actually more, more aligned to the European oak than we are to the Irish oak that Milton has made. So Milton call it Dare Gallic. Dare Gallic is called Quercus Petrae. That's the genus of wood. We are Dare Galla, and Dare Galla is a Quercus Rober, which is actually more closer to a European oak wood tree than the, the Middleton uh, Dare Gallic. Handy thing is the Milton Dargalic could retail in excess now of about 300 euro. Um, Michael, I don't know what your price at, but I'm assuming you're around that kind of uh, 55 up to kind of 60, kind of 65 mark there for yourselves. Yeah, I think it's I think it's 55 for the, the, yeah. the box though, yeah. And that Irish oak, to me, imparts that woodiness. It imparts a bit of spice, a bit of butteriness. Um, it brings a flavor of kind of sweetness to it, but not too much. Uh, it is, to give the background on it, it's aged for three years in bourbon, one year in Irish oak. And then when somebody was asking earlier, what is the difference on a first fill make? That is the big difference. Uh, you're getting that woodiness, you're getting that earthiness, you're getting a bit of spice out of it. Uh, I do get like a little bit of apricot and a bit of that kind of freshness from it. But I suppose that really all just, when you start getting that kind of fruitiness, that freshness, that, that all is encompassing kind of within that woody kind of note. It's a really nice whiskey. I get a sort of wine sort of note off it, you know. I, I don't know. I, I, 
I couldn't say what wine, but you know, it's almost like a great a grapiness, and maybe that's a, a, a fruity flavour I'm just picking up off it. Someone mentions like maybe a little bit of peaty note. That's probably more like a, the char sort of coming through from it, you know. Yeah, it's it's the earthiness coming through from it. There also is so it's a level three char on this barrel, so it is more of a kind of it's a level three char, which is more to like a kind of a toasting rather than a char like we're used to kind of those but that's going to give us more of those woody notes as well and no the only reason for that that char for that toast is just to open up the wood a little bit and to give us a little bit of flavor from these trees we were able to grow we were to sorry build um 50 casks from the 14 trees that we originally felled um and it gave we were able to build uh 250 liter hogshead barrels um and it uh, so, but even that, even like Michael, what you're saying about the wine, Linda just came in saying tannins. So it's, that's a lot that you get from wine because wa- wine is kind of aged in that kind of charred new oak barrel as well. So it's probably a lot of that kind of similarity that you're picking up on as well within those flavors because the flavor that's imparted from the wood in some wines is really imparted in here as well. Yeah, what would you call it? It's like a, a flavor explosion, you know, it's almost. Uh, you know, it's almost like taking a taking some whiskey and spraying it around the, the Opal Fruit Factory, you know. <laughs> Sorry, they're, what are they now? They're Starbursts these days, aren't they? Whatever they're called. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Show your age there, Mike. If you're as old as me, you know what an Opal Fruit is, you know. Well, you go in and spray whiskey around the Opal Fruit Factory. That's what you're, so that's what I get here. Fruit gums, Colin. <laughs> Oh, if we all had to start thinking about the things we remembered, we'd all be fecked right now. <laughs> I remember I used to go to on holiday to Spain and Italy. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, remember, you'd sit, remember when you'd sit in a pub and have a pint? <laughs> <laughs> Let me know any good sheep means. No. <laughs> um, any other questions, thoughts on the on the pot still? It's it's really enjoyable and it's 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 a, it's a great whiskey. It is, um, you know, I, I the shock is is not cheap. So to to bring no. bring this out at, at this price point, I think is excellent as well. You know, and it's it the value proposition is a big part of it. That the, the amazing value you're getting from this. There's also a really interesting part when you actually look at the bottle. So if you can see the front of that bottle, there are four numbers positioned on the front of the bottle, and they are the Bottle number, the cast number, the tree number, and the batch number. So you can actually go to the Glendalough website. You can input from which tree this came from. So this came from tree number one. Uh, it was a part of batch number two. It was cask number three, and it was bottle number 115. I don't know what you have there for your stuff, Michael, which was done. But you can actually input this, this information into the Glendalough uh, website, and you will actually get a video of that tree being felled in the woods. And you can actually name that tree yourself or name that particular barrel from that tree yourself. And we keep a record of everybody that's had these, that inputs it. And you might, I'll be all perfectly honest, when I was first told this as well, I was like, so you just took like a video of the one tree, maybe from five different angles and you went, there it is. Literally every tree was videoed as it was being chopped down to make sure you can actually, when you talk about traceability and traceability is such an important thing right now, we can literally trace this to the tree that it came from. So it, it, just let everybody know what they are actually drinking. They are drinking tree number one, batch number two, casks number three, and the bottle I have in my hand is bottle 244. So it probably means that you're probably drinking bottle 243, 244, or 245. It'd be whatever is in that, the, the six yeah. bottles that go into a case. They all came out the same case. But uh, forgetting the bottle numbers, you're tree number one, batch number two, cask number three. Easy enough. One, two, three. <laughs> So that's that's pretty much the, the, the main three numbers is there. The bottle numbers obviously will change a little bit, but as they're packed. Anybody have any other questions there for ourselves? I thought that was that was a beautiful whiskey, Alan. Shall we yeah. shall we move on to our our yeah our, 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 our the grand finale or you know everybody's got at least three times more whiskey than me because you know the rest of it is on my rug. I might, I, might, I might just pick up the rug and start sniffing it. <laughs> it's soaked in whiskey. It's soaked in Glendalock 25 year old. That was, uh, you know what, the Michael, the liquid you're missing is probably the first you missed from that pour at the very start. <laughs> I 
and I would like it's even when you talk about like doing that, like <laughs> I, I don't think when we were developing the 25 and the 17 year old, I really don't think anybody thought, oh, we want a pour to fit in this bottle, do we? <laughs> yeah. I said, if I walked into a bar and seen a pour it's, in it, I think this really is like, hard to get the liquid out of the bottle. You know, you've got to, <laughs> you've got to do this, and yeah, yeah. Like, it, it, it's, it's a great bottle, you know, and it's yes. it's a luxury, it's a luxury bottle, and it's made to be that way, and that's yeah. The that's presentation the on it is gorgeous. Yeah. Um. So this is the twenty-five-year-old, and I, I suppose I'll be perfectly honest with this one. This is even my first time trying this. So we're kind of all experiencing this together at this one. So that's something special in itself for myself. I've been looking forward to trying this. So Michael came up with this idea for this taste and I was putting my hands to the sky and saying, hallelujah. Another mass reference there for you there. But um, <laughs> I I'm getting hands- quite emotional now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was delighted to try and get a chance to try this. Um, probably before we kick off with this, what I'd preface this with, I'd say, when people start talking about whiskies and we start talking about releases and age of this, people use the word rare. One thing I'd say is this is this this is not rare. This is unique in the way in what it is. So first off, like twenty five years, like that color is golden, amber, woody, dark, like everything you want to kind of explain out of that. Like the legs on it. It's probably not th- th- even the viscosity, even Michael, when you're saying the viscosity on it, probably not as viscous as the 25 year old, but you can even see like within it, like it is, it has a thickness to it just in the glass alone. It's not like swishing around like water or like some of the other whiskeys would have, like it's sticking together and it's not even growing too far. The nose round just getting kind of sweetness from, from it, getting um, getting fruits, getting that Irish oak impact, getting so much in it. And I'll explain the kind of what we looked at from the the, the wood that goes into it. Fran, cloves, great call there. I'm getting a bit of orange off it, personally. Dark chocolate, 100% Linda. Did you guys are doing my job for me on this one. This is great. Even it was one of those things I decided that I didn't even want to go looking at tasting notes we have in this. I wanted to experience this myself. Small bit of peat, cinnamon, all rolling in. So on her taste. Dip tap. Are we talking about are we still talking about things we remember, Graham? Are we? <laughs> tar 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 tin. Tar tar. Tartar, tartar, tartan apples. Oh, sorry, I was trying to figure that one out. Is that is that that is that, is that an apple yeah. pie? Yeah, no, I know, I got that. I was just reading it wrong for a second. I was like, Tintin? Why are we talking about Tintin? <laughs> On the taste of it, like just melt in your mouth, kind of butteriness, bold sort of flavor from it. A lot of kind of, I'm getting a that dark chocolate kind of bitterness on the back Turkish delight there like so much going on in it really so much going on here that uh getting that kind of dried fruits those raisins sultanas coming through in it like apples coming through in it It, it's do you know what and I was kind of holding back on this before I explained what's going on here maple syrup brand another great call this is almost a combination of everything we've nearly had here tonight but the Mizanora this ages in bourbon uh, or Ross, uh, in Pedro Jimenez or Rosso Sherry and in Irish Oak. So we're getting so many different kind of flavors out of this. And like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like pinpoint individual ones here as well. Viscosity, like big mouthfeel, like butteriness, big, big kind of rolling around the mouth, sticks with you, lies in there. Like, and I'm, I'm taking like literally out of a little tasting glass. I'm trying to be fr- fragile with it. But like, I'm sure if I took like a big sip out of something like this, it would just sit and stay and wash around constantly for a while. I'm scared to have another sip because I won't be able to talk after it because I won't want to, because I won't want to open my mouth again. I've got enough left in this glass for a really good mouthful. And after that, I'm just not going to ever talk again. <laughs> and then then, I'm, then I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open all the old 25-year-old bottles and start just sniffing them. 
<laughs> but then yeah. that rock then afterwards. Uh, yeah. Oh, and you're killing us, man. You know, you've, 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 you're giving us two whiskeys of the year. Yeah, this is just this is not allowed, you know. You're, not, you're, you're, you're lucky if you're allowed one, you know. Uh, if you want it, Michael, we'll, we'll, we can, um, Ravine, we can uh, sit down when everything is done and we'll have to do an independent adjudication on all these again, will we? Yeah, I, I know in the door with the jackets hanging on it, behind that door, there's three bottles of 25 year olds sitting in there. There may only be two tomorrow morning. <laughs> the temptation is real at this point. Yeah. In fact, I, I've got loads of plans for tomorrow. If the weather's good, I want to go up and dig me allotment and grow and put, do things up there, but that could be a write off. <laughs> I could be drinking whiskey till the early hours of the morning now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Alan, you're a fucking devil. Oh, like like I said, this this is even my first time trying this, and even as I'm talking, you know, Michael, we're talking here. I haven't had a drink maybe for a couple of minutes, and it's still just right here, right at the bottom of my at the let's say bottom of my jaw into my throat. It's just sitting right there. I'm salivating from it as well, from what's actually left behind as it sits there. Like absolutely superb. Um, <clears throat> Stewie had a question there, so we go with 15 years bourbon, 10 years. Uh, Pedro Jimenez Orosho from uh, Montilla and one year of uh, Irish Oak and this is that first fill Irish Oak as well uh, so that's where that Irish Oak impact is really coming in on that first fill um, come on lads we'll head down to the canal but Damien we're right beside each other so I'm, that's probably better than Redmond's I'll see you there <laughs> um, but just really like you're getting the impact of all of those barrels and like even that 15 years in bourbon is kind of generally an unheard of kind of aspect. There's not many I know, and I'm sure somebody here might know of one or two more, but there's not many I've definitely tried. That would be 15 years in bourbon. Then to go 10 years in sherry. And then that one year in Irish oak. And probably the biggest part, even when we talk about this 25-year-old, we talk about the Irish oak pot still. Uh, <laughs> bring up the tip bags. Sure we found this. Um, when we started to use the Irish oak barrels, uh, we've seen that the wood had such a massive impact in a short amount of time. We're currently like just using them on first fill for a year because we don't believe it needs any more. Because even that question on like the difference between first fill, second fill, third fill, fourth fill, the first fill was causing such an impact. We needed to kind of draw it back a little bit. So we're using it once or twice for that one year period to kind of season the barrels. Then we'll start looking at, right, we've got Irish oak that we can age for longer in. So we're going to start looking at 10, 15, 5, 10, 15, 25, uh, full Irish oak aging. But it's just for the moment that that Irish oak was having such a colossal impact straight away. We found a year was more than enough just to do the job. And you're getting that Irish oak impact off that. Like when you have so many flavors fighting there, 15 years in bourbon, that's where the predominance of that color is coming from, is that 15 years in bourbon cask, you know, in American oak. The 10 years in Ross's Sherry is giving you that kind of finishing out. Like the two of them are the majority of giving us that creamy mouthfeel giving us that kind of bonus, giving us that kind of butterscotch, somebody was saying there. And the Irish oak is just adding another level of that kind of freshness, of that sweetness, of the fruitiness, of that, again, straw and hay kind of note to it. It's an absolute belter, isn't it? Mm -hmm. As we say in Scotland, you wee dancer. <laughs> oh, no, that is, that is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Tina and Carson, how is the visitor centre coming along? I guess it got delayed. Yeah, the current situation has, has been a big, big issue. Obviously, construction under problems, and I don't think anybody, I'm sure everybody here could probably make an argument to how essential um, building distilleries would be for visitor centres, but I don't think anybody would believe it. Um, so it has been delayed for the time being, and it, God knows how long it's going to have a knock-on effect. The distillery, the visitor centre that we're looking at is literally on a site just off of the Glendalough UNESCO site. So I said, it's a protected site. You're not allowed to develop there, but we are literally on the border boundary of where you can and can't build. And there's a beautiful site there. It's, it's very kind of dense um, field at the moment, but it's, it's there ready to break ground, but this has just delayed everything. So hopefully we can see something coming uh, down the road. And uh, once we all get past this moment and we all get to come back into normal times, um, We'll hopefully see a lot more. Yeah, and Ard, I'd say it's an essential building too, but you know, <laughs> I don't think they'll believe me. Um, just before everybody disappears, because we're near the end of tasting, I've, I've, I've one announcement later on at the, when I finish talking. 
I just won the announcement for you. But uh, uh, thanks to everybody who's turned up tonight. We actually have people from uh, the Netherlands and 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 uh, Germany on the call tonight and join in. Thanks very much, to you because I know you're you. I think you're a little bit of an hour ahead of us. Uh, I think we change our we all change our clocks over the weekend, don't we? So we all go, and the days are getting lighter and the nights are getting brighter. It'll be excellent uh, over this weekend. Uh, but many thanks to Alan. Uh, for talking us through these amazing whiskies tonight, it, it, it was a. I, I don't think there was a. There was not a bad drink in there whatsoever. Everything was absolutely excellent. Every single drop, the poaching was phenomenal. Uh, the double barrel, the, the the triple barrel, the pot still, yeah, the seventeen and then twenty five. Yeah, they're very exceptional whiskies and phenomenal. So, Alan, thanks very much for for hosting that. And, and turning up tonight, uh, you've been you've been fantastic. And thanks to all, everybody in CC Hellenic for uh, getting behind us and, and getting this uh, on and, and putting this together. It's been fantastic. Um, just want to let you all know that our, our next tasting uh, is coming up in two weeks' time. It's actually on sale on the website now. Um, I'll put up a link in a second. Um, but if you go on the website and just click on the, the banner, uh, it says virtual tastings. It should actually just uh, take you to it. Uh, I'll just let you know what it is. It's a it's a beer and whiskey tasting. Uh, we had a little bit of a, a success doing that um, a couple of weeks ago on St Patrick's Eve. We've done some beer and whiskey, so now we're we're, we're really sort of upping it a little bit uh, on beer and whiskey, and we're going to be working with Dot Brewing, and uh, they've got some barrel aged stouts. We have two barrel aged stouts. Uh, in, in around eight nine percent mark, real great beers, and we're going to match that with uh, some spot whiskey. So it's called uh, dots and spots, dots and spots whiskey days. And so we'll have green spot, green spot, Chateau Leovo Barton, yellow spot, and red spot in the tasting. So something a little bit different. And um, the email uh, for the sales of this goes out on Monday. But if you're on, you're, if you're still listening in tonight, you've got first dibs on buying the tickets until Monday. Um, it's 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 sort of a, a new way of doing things for us. We're, we know there's a lot of you joining all the time, and uh, sometimes when the email comes out on Monday, it was a bit berserk online, and some people miss out on tickets. So it's sort of like a bit of a loyalty. If you're, you know, if you're turning up to our tastings every week, we think we should let you get first dibs on buying the next one essentially. So that's up. That's online now. That the link is up there. You can you can click away and buy your tickets. Uh, have you bought any other products in different orders? We'll, we'll, we'll package them up together and we'll refund your postage. Don't worry about that. Um, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, uh, Alan, thanks very much. Any final words? Yeah, uh, just want to say thanks so much to everybody for coming on and for asking questions, getting involved. Listen, you know what? You make my life and my jobs a lot easier when you all get engaged and you all talk and you all ask questions. Sometimes these things, like I, I will say one thing, like Michael, thank you very much for having us here tonight. Um, it's been fantastic. And like, I can only speak for myself. Uh, I do a number of these every once in a while. And I have a tough job, you know? I've even got my own little chair set up to make sure I get, the, I get comfortable doing these. But uh, when I do these tastings, you know, that interaction is so important. And the, what you get from yourself, Michael, and what you bring to the whiskey community and the spirit community here is 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 unmatched. You get engaged, you talk, you speak, you have an honesty in you as well. Like I'm sure if you didn't like something I gave you, you'd say it straight out. <laughs> you make my job and everybody's experience here, you make my job easier, but everybody's experience like more enjoyable by your involvement in these. And it's always always a pleasure to do these with you. You work fantastically with us and I can't wait to do a lot more with you and I can't wait you know when times come and we can all stand in a room together and have a tasting I can't wait to do them as well and we have, we've spoke already about the likes of McAllen and Highland Park that we can hopefully do stuff with you as well again and I'm really looking forward to it but no thank you very much everybody for your time on a Friday night for your interaction for getting involved and Michael again thank you very much fantastic thank you Alan and thanks everybody for, for taking part tonight thanks very much uh, have a great weekend. Hopefully we'll have some good weather and we can go and enjoy it. Uh, good night, everybody. Take care.